So hello everyone, thank you for joining our Global Red Flags webinar today. My name is Andy Okun and I'm the Community and Capacity Building Manager at Open Contracting Partnership. And today we're going to be working you through our Red Flags um, methodology and Red Flags indicators. And you'll also be hearing from someone um, within the field who has been practicing with Red Flags. And so you'll get a real life um, experience or detailed experience of Red Flags in practice. So I'm going to quickly run through our agenda and objectives for the day. And please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat section, in the chat box on your right-hand side. I will also um, share call notes where you can put in your details. I believe I have most people's details here. Um, you can put in your details anyway. And um, if you have any questions or comments, you can add them on there or in the chat section. So um, our agenda for today is just the welcome which I've done and there'll be a red flags um, presentation and then we'll have a speaker case study and then we'll open the floor finally for community discussions and questions. And then we'll have some final reflections and next steps and we'll invite you to complete our post event survey. So we have two objectives for today's session. We want all the participants today to understand the OCDS red flags methodology, and you will also learn how um, you can use open procurement data to calculate red flags. So I'll talk about a little bit about our organization, Open Contracting Partnership, before I hand over to our speakers. So as many of you might already know, OCP is a silo busting not for profit organization that seeks to open up and transform public um, contracting. And we work on open data and open government across the entire chain of public of public contracting. So that is from planning to tender to award and to implementation. And we're active in over 40 countries, both OECD and non OECD countries. And the bigger picture of what we do is that we help partners think different about procurement um, using an open governance, governance and open data approach to drive impactful and sustainable reform. And how do we work? We look at our work in three ways, in terms of implementation, learning, and advocacy. With implementation, we provide technical assistance and capacity building for procurement reform projects. So whether you're a publisher of procurement data or a user of procurement data, we're able to provide technical assistance to you. And then for learning, we carry out research, monitoring, and evaluation to document which activities and outputs are actually leading to impact within the open contracting field. And we organize sessions just as this one to ensure that people are actively engaged in our public um, procurement conversation and we're actively building the field together. And then in terms of advocacy, finally, we support our partners with key messages and evidence to advocate for change in public procurement globally. So um, that's basically what we do at Open Contracting Partnership. And now we're going to dive into an aspect of our work, which is the red flags methodology, which is what we use to identify certain issues within the procurement data that you have access to. So today we will have two speakers, my colleague Camilla and one of our partners, uh, Vitaly, would also be speaking. So at this point, I'll let them introduce themselves and I'll hand over to Camilla to start the learning session. So Camilla, Vitaly. Thank you so much, Andy. And it's great to be here uh, with you all. Andy, I'm gonna just quickly share my screen because I yes. need to share some links. So um, okay. just let me share my screen. And uh, as Andy was saying, so my name is Camila Salazar. I am OCP's lead data analyst. So I work with uh, all things related to data and users globally trying to use and analyze procurement data. So it's great to have so many people joining uh, this webinar today. Andy will share a document shortly so that you can introduce yourself. If you wanna give your contact details, if you have any questions during the webinar, uh, you can uh, ask them in the document. We'll have a Q&A. Uh, session after this presentation. So just feel free to leave your questions and we, we will also share the resources uh, that we're gonna showcase here today. 
So um, the part of this, uh, this first part of the session is about telling you about a methodology uh, we developed with uh, the work that we've been doing globally about how can you use procurement data to calculate red flags. And as you know, uh, red flag, uh, red flag analysis is actually one of the use cases when we speak about procurement, you know, that are many use cases uh, that, 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 that are interesting uh, to, to work on, such as competition, um, value for money. But then when we talk about public integrity, uh, it's, it's one of the key use cases that a lot of users want to focus on. And related to public integrity, we can um, put the red flags or red flag analysis. In short, red flag, uh, a red flag is a suspicious behavior indicator or an irregularity in procurement that can occur at all points along the entire chain of public procurement from planning to implementation. And we talk about suspicious behavior because something to keep in mind is that when we're doing red flag analysis, it's not necessarily that, that every one of these red flags uh, will point out a, a potential corruption case or that there's uh, actually wrongdoing, but it helps us analyze behaviors that might be suspicious and that might be worth analyzing further. Um, why is this approach necessary and why is it interesting as well in terms of um, like we've seen a lot of users uh, uh, trying to, to use this approach. The idea of red flying is not only to signal a potential like corruption if it actually happened, but it's actually designed to change the approach from punitive to preventive. And is this idea that actually corruption and fraud can potentially be detected and prevented beforehand. And especially now, since there is a lot of data available and there are a lot of contexts where procurement data is available in open formats, and then this analysis is possible. Um, it can also, when you're constantly monitoring procurement, uh, it can actually help you to identify and promote positive practices to, for instance, identify inefficiencies in the process or in the system themselves, and then generate change from them. And also, when you're also doing this analysis and monitoring as a daily basis, then you can also uh, use that to generate policy recommendations or technical changes in the procurement system and practices. So it's not only about signaling potential wrongdoing, but actually to improving the whole system and how procurement is handled in a particular context. So as I mentioned, each step of the contracting process has, has its own red flags. And as you know, uh, procurement, it's not just about uh, an entity awarding a contract and who won that contract, but actually procurement has multiple stages where uh, we can we can be we can calculate this type of indicator. So um, when we were developing this methodology, and if you're familiar with uh, the open contracting data standard that I will talk about in short, then we organize procurement in five different stages, and in each of these stages, you can calculate red flags and there are indicators that are, uh, happen or can happen at each of these stages of the process. And this is important as well because sometimes we tend to focus a lot on the award and contract stages, but then a lot of things can be prevented or detected, for instance, from the planning stage and when the tender, when the bids are, are open or even in the implementation of the contract. And sometimes for this for these stages, it's even harder to find data, but I'm going to give you some ideas on what you can do um, in those cases. So just to guide you a bit about the step by step, and of course, in practice, this can be a, a bit different and there are extra steps that can be added at, at, and we can hear from from our experts and maybe from people in the field uh, that have been working in red flags as well that are in, in this call. Uh, the first thing is uh, to identify uh, a corruption scheme. So. Uh, for this, you can look in academic literature. There's a lot of evidence already that, that, that has documented what type of self-corruption schemes can be associated or found in procurement. And of course, when we have this guidance, and I will show you in a second, we have uh, the different corruption schemes that can be associated with each one of these red flags. Once you have that, for each of these schemes, there are particular 
uh, red flag that can be associated with those. So for instance, if you're trying to analyze collusive bidding in a market to calculate only one indicator, it's not going to be necessary. So there's going to be a set of indicators or metrics that can be associated and they can be calculated in order to detect or potentially detect that collusive scheme. So when you see the guide, you will see that you will have for each of the, of the, of the schemes, you will have multiple red flags and indicators that can be calculated. Um, the third part, and I think this is the most important since um, even if we have guidance that is focused on using standard data, um, it's really important that when you apply this in practice, you need to keep your context into account. And particularly, this is particularly necessary when we talk about risk indicators. And, uh, and, and, and this is necessary because, for instance, um, when you, if you have an indicator, you need to establish certain thresholds, uh, for instance, where to consider that um, a procurement escapes or, or distances from what's the norm or what's considered a normal. So uh, for that, you need to look at your local context at the local regulations to identify what thresholds can you establish. So just to give you an example on this, uh, for instance, one uh, common red flag is when there is a really short period uh, to, uh, that is given to the bidders to submit bids in a procurement process. But then the question is, what is too short? Like, uh, how can we know if a process is too short? And for this, you can look, for instance, what is the procurement method being used and then see if in local regulations, there is an indication on what is the minimum bidding period for each of these processes. If this is not the case, you can also see international practice of what's considered um, like, like a good practice uh, for, for this indicators. You can also look in academic literature or empirical evidence about what is considered reasonable, uh, a reasonable period. And also you can do, for instance, for some indicators, you can actually identify those thresholds if you run some data analysis as well, just to be able to identify uh, cut points or outliers in the data, and then this help you establish these thresholds. And this is probably the part where you're, you're gonna be starting working with the data and thinking about if this is feasible in practice to establish this threshold. So it's really important that you keep this context in mind because if you apply this in multiple countries then these thresholds can vary for some indicators. Uh, the last part of this and uh, a key ingredient is a data. And of course, the, this red flag analysis, you can, I don't know, identify red flags if you look at paper documents or uh, if you do, um, if you do, if, if you look uh, for, for paper-based documents in general. But the idea and, and what we've seen in the field is that the most advanced tools of risk detection and, and analysis, they actually need data and machine readable data and a potentially standardized data. So I put an example here about um, a, a data standard that we support at OCP uh, that some of you might be familiar with, that it's called the Open Contracting Data Standard, that it's a data standard that tells you how can you structure and disclose procurement data um, in, in a standardized format so then you can capture all data about the different stages of the process. And I'm not going to go deep into explaining uh, the details of OCBS, but I wanted just to give you an idea about how um, this data is available globally. So we have currently uh, more than 30 publishers around the globe that is publishing, that are publishing OCBS data. Uh, we have cases of countries publishing their contact tracking data in their national systems. Uh, and we have also examples of uh, publications set the subnational or local level as well. So uh, as I said, we're going to share this presentation. We're going to share the links in case you're interested in analyzing data from any uh, of these countries. Um, and we can guide you through how to access the data and give you um, just a bit of context on what's available in each of the countries. Um, Things to consider because I, I, before I, I show you our guidance is that you really need to, and as I've mentioned before, uh, about what can be considered suspicious or wrong when we speak about procurement. You need data, of course, but then you need to be really careful as well with data quality issues. 
and uh, your red flag analysis is going to be as good as the data you have because uh, sometimes um, for instance uh, you might need key fields in order to calculate a lot of indicators and if that data is not available then the potential to capture this risk indicators um, it, it, it's it's reduced uh, of course as i mentioned you need to keep context into into account and you always need um to to think about red flagging as the beginning of your story of or of or of your process of detecting uh, risk indicators because you probably will need to do more in-depth research. So think of this as a tool that can help you filter. Uh, uh, if you have a, a thousand procedures, then it can help you filter a subset of those just to investigate further and actually see if there was uh, wrongdoing. So uh, after that introduction, I, I want to show you um, some of the work we did at OCP and some of the guidance and methodology that we have and that we've shared uh, with partners that you can see in our website. So we mapped red flags to the open contracting data standard and develop a guidance, uh, a list of indicators that you can calculate um, using OCBS data. So the, 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 we recently updated this material. So what I'm going to show you is, is a, a spreadsheet that has a list of 73 red flags. We have a no CDS mapping for each of the red flags, a calculation method, the rationale behind the indicators, and then references to academic or empirical evidence about that indicator. So in case you want to investigate this further, see how this is done in practice. If you are super curious and want to read the paper and see the model, then you can see that in, 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 our, in our guidance as well. So I'm going to open the link here. Uh, just to give you an idea of how this looks like. So uh, as I mentioned, you have here, uh, this is a public spreadsheet. So you have here the stage of the process it relates to, as I mentioned, you can have these indicators in the different stages of the process. You can see the associated uh, scheme, the red flag, the indicators. Uh, there's an explanation about the calculation method. Um, the rationale behind it, that it, it basically explains why is this considered a red flag or why is this important uh, to calculate. Then there is a list of all the OCDS fields that you need in order to calculate this. But if you're working in a country or in a context where OCDS data is not available, there's a column here as well that tells the description of these fields so that you can see um, if you have them in, in the data that you're using. So, for instance, if the field here is called uh, the tender period start date in, in OCDS, then what you actually need is a date on, on when the tender started. So you can use this guidance even if uh, it can be automated a bit, and, and I'm going to show you a resource that we have. If you have an OCDS publication, then uh, you can use it as well uh, if you don't have this data. Uh, if you have data, open data in other formats. Um, and as I mentioned, this is a long list of 73 red flags. So when you're doing this analysis, this guide can actually help you first. If you look at all the lists, you can, it can help you prioritize what uh, indicators you're interested in and then see what fields do you actually need to calculate uh, those indicators so that you can prioritize the data collection, or if you, that field is not available, then put then work on, on how can you actually collect that data. Um, let me just go back here to the presentation. So, okay, we have the guidance and then some uh, another resource that we have and then we're happy to guide you through is uh, a notebook, uh, a collaboratory notebook, if you're familiar a bit with, with code. Um, you, you don't actually have to code to use this notebook, but it, it's, it's, a, it's a notebook that it can help you check for OCDS publishers if a publication has the necessary fields to calculate a red flag. So the output of this, of this notebook looks a bit like this, where you will have a table. So let's say uh, this was calculated, for instance, for Moldova. So uh, you will have a table about um, that indicates what is the red flag, what are the fields needed to calculate that red flag, and then if it's possible, for instance, if that publication has those fields published, 
and if it's possible, such as this one over here, then it tells you for how, what proportion of procedures you're able to calculate this indicator for. So this is a great tool uh, and we're happy to guide you through on how to use it. If you're working uh, if, with OCDS data, it can give you an idea about, for instance, what fields uh, you might be missing, what you should, you should prioritize and actually what you can do with the data. So you can see, for instance, what proportion of, of red flags out of the 70 red flags, how many can you actually calculate and what is the coverage of those indicators? So this is, as I mentioned, for instance, an example for Moldova. So there are a lot of actually, they have good data to calculate a lot of collusion red flags, for instance, because they publish great detail on the individual beats for each procedure. So the, they can know, for instance, running this notebook, what can be calculated or not with the data. Um, and also, if you're curious, uh, if, you're, if, if you know a bit how to code, then if you don't have OCDS data, you might be able to adapt this notebook just to check that uh, for your own data. So just to, just to wrap up, um, uh, things to consider, and I'm pretty sure that uh, if some of you have done red flag analysis, then you will know that a lot of the process, it's about data cleaning, doing some manual checks, to verify that you're capturing the right data, that actually the indicator is capturing uh, suspicious uh, behavior. Uh, you, so you really need to do this process of manual checks or, or actually checking uh, the data, doing fact checking and clearly stating where available data is insufficient or you might need to do a bit more uh, analysis. Also, please don't rely on one reflex. So for instance, uh, if you have a red flag, if you find a procedure that only received a single bid, then that is not necessarily, it might be a red flag, of course it's a red flag, but then uh, you need to, uh, to see if there are other red flags that can be associated with that process. And truth is that, for instance, if you have a procedure where uh, you find, for instance, if it's a procedure that is part of a collusive scheme, you will actually be able to capture not just one red flag during the process, but a lot of red flags. Um, and this, just this, in this idea of fact checking and verifying, the idea is not just to jump into conclusions of, of conflict of interest right away. It's just a matter of being able to subset your data and do some more in-depth analysis uh, and that can help you facilitate the monitoring process. And this, uh, and just to finalize, this is an approach that we've seen in the field that it's being used a lot, for instance, by civil society interested in monitoring procurement, but it's also more and more being used by governments themselves to have these risk indicators, metrics um, within their procurement uh, systems and, and, and teams just to use this approach to actually detect and facilitate their work in terms of monitoring uh, procurement. So it's, it's an approach that can be used both by civil society, academia, and also by government agencies as well. And I'm gonna stop there and we're gonna hear from Vitaly who will show us how uh, we, have the, we have that guidance, but then how does this look in practice and what things can be done in the field? And as I mentioned, if you have any questions, just feel free to put them in the chat or in the document. And we will have, after the palace presentation, an open floor for you to answer any questions you might have. And I'm going to okay. stop sharing. Uh, thank you very much, Camila, for your great work. We uh, use uh, the list uh, of indicators that uh, you present us uh, in our projects and it really helps us to generate ideas. Uh, so thank you, Andy, for uh, inviting me and let me share my screen. Uh, do you see me well? Yes, you can yes, see me. Okay. So my name is Vitaly Tenkinshu and I'm a uh, CEO and a co-founder of the Datanomics, a business intelligence company in Kazakhstan. And um, the last 10 years, uh, my team has been working as a contractor for the government of Kazakhstan and specifically with law enforcement units. And 
uh, now I would like to share the experience of my team with you. And uh, we have had some interesting projects in the field of red flags for identifying economic and corruption crimes in public procurement. So I will tell you about four major projects and the uh, outcomes. Uh, first of it is a project for uh, that we have done for financial police about 10 years ago. And back then the process of public procurement was fully done on paper and there is no uh, data in digital format at all. No plans, no contracts, no tenders. However, there was the database of payments from government customers to their suppliers. And our goal was to automatically check those transactions and spot the risky ones. So we have made a list of risky companies from 11 different sources, like bankrupt, shell companies, and their clients, tax debtors, and so on. All those companies had no right to participate in public procurement, according to the law. So uh, we developed an app that automatically compares payment to suppliers with those list of risky companies. And this app allowed us to flag the suspicious companies to um, suspicious payments to suppliers. And financial police analysts used this app to detect risky transactions. And then they focus field operations and investigations on those customers and suppliers in different regions in Kazakhstan. And those investigations led to real criminal cases. About 100 criminal cases were initiated with 6.3 billion tenge of damage. And also 11 billion tenge was additionally charged by the results of tax audits. So it was a good project. And the next uh, project for financial police was much bigger. It involved in five companies and it used more than 50 data sources, mainly government databases. And more than 100 red flags were automatically calculated, not only in field of public procurement, but also in other areas, such as tax evasion. And uh, one of the innovations was identification of hidden relations between actors for instance, between customers and their suppliers or between two suppliers. We used many data sources to find some type of relations like common employees, common uh, addresses, family relations, property relations and transactions, buy and selling um, real estate, for example, buy and selling vehicles and so on. And we real many local government executives that gave contracts from a single source without any competition to companies owned by the immediate family, brother, wife, son, and so on. And uh, we also significantly extended the list of suspicious companies. Uh, much work was done in order to detect shell companies registered on nominees. Specifically, we found hundreds of companies registered on homeless people. Uh, we have our police have a database of homeless people. It's about uh, 20,000 rows, and we have a database of legal entities. So we compare uh, them, and we found hundreds of companies registered uh, on, on those uh, homeless people. And so there were multiple mentions in media about this project because the results were significant and according to official press release the project helped to initiate over 600 criminal cases with more than uh, 100 billion tenge of damage and this was very good so the next project uh, big project um, we did for general prosecutor's office of kazakhstan and our main goal was to assess the risk of economic and corruption crimes in public procurement. And we have developed a methodology for analyzing public procurement data. And we have described uh, 42 red flags in this document. And those red flags cover all stages from planning to payment. Uh, but we were unable to code, uh, write code for all 42 red flags because of lack of data. 
and uh, we develop applications that automate eight of those red flags. And we found three major of them. First is buying commodities from a single source at an overestimated price. Yeah, we calculated a median price, a normal price range, and compare it to plan and contract da data. Uh, so we can calculate this uh, red flag. Also, we uh, uh, the second red flag is about increasing the uh, price of contract with additional agreement. It was a common practice in Kazakhstan until 2019. It uh, avoid it used to avoid competition and give a contract at a lower estimated price to their preferred supplier. And as a result of the project, the law was modified and now this scheme is not possible anymore. And the third red flag is about transferring money from a supplier to a shell company um, just right after receiving the payment from the, the government. Um, so the outcomes of the uh, project was very positive. In the first year, prosecutors identified 37 possible crimes for a total amount of damage of uh, 55 billion tenge, and 32 pre-trial pre uh, proceedings were started. And the next projects we done for uh, civil society committee. Uh, and the goal of the project was to analyze effectiveness and uh, effectiveness of financing our government organization, NGOs, uh, through the state contracts for social service. Uh, there, there is such a uh, type of contracts uh, in Kazakhstan, and only NGOs are eligible for those contracts. So we develop an app to check this, and we use uh, NGO database. And we compare public contracts with the NGO database, and we found uh, about uh, 70 contracts worth over 1.8 billion tenge with commercial organizations, which is a violation of the law. So uh, I have shortly described uh, four of our projects on Reflex in public procurement. And now I want to tell you uh, more about most interesting red flags that we calculated in our projects. And uh, first red flag is about our overpricing of commodities. Uh, this red flag is especially important if purchase happens in a non-competitive way. And we calculated both at the planning at a, and the, uh, at the contract stage. Uh, because at the planning stage, it is possible to interfere and change the way of purchasing to a competitive one. And um, but the, this red flag is not suitable for works, services, or complex goods uh, that require technical specifications for buying, like computers, mobiles, and so on, because comparing prices is very difficult uh, for them. And uh, we calculate it only for commodities, uh, simple goods like office supplies, gas, and so on. And we use uh, median price instead of average price because it is more resistant to outliers. And next, we calculate a uh, normal price range. Uh, this is a range between first quartile and the third quartile of distribution of price. And uh, this, race, this range includes about a half of all prices. And the price is considered normal if it is in this range. And as a source of pricing data, we use only completed contracts that were won in a competitive way because single sourced contracts are not a good indicator of a fair price. And we also do not use contracts on older than 12 months for calculating median price. So we do not need to do an adjustment for inflation rate. Also price differ from region to region. So we must consider these when doing our median price calculations. Uh, and second uh, red flag is about additional agreements to avoid competition and uh, until 2019, the scheme uh, was commonly used in Kazakhstan by many customers to 
avoid competition and give a contract to the preferred supplier. Uh, so let me explain it by example. Um, customer need to buy 100,000 packs of paper worth about 100 million in gear. And the customer wants to give this contract to his close supplier for a very high price. But this is illegal to do directly because there are strict rules and procedures for this kind of garment purchase. So the customer opens a tender for only one pack of paper uh, with very complicated qualification requirements for potential suppliers. So most of reliable suppliers refuse to participate in this tender because of such administrative overhead for only one pack of paper. And only that uh, preferred supplier takes part in this tender and he proposed a very high price for the one pack of paper. Uh, the tender is likely to be canceled because only one supplier took part. And after that, the customer has a right to sign a contract with that supplier directly. So he signs a contract for that high price. And right after that, the customer signs additional agreement with the supplier for the whole amount of uh, 100,000 packs of paper and on that high price. And according to the law, the customer has the right uh, to increase the sum of the contract if the price of one item is not changed. So this way, everything looks, looks legal. And uh, this was a common practice in Kazakhstan. So we found thousands of similar cases in 2018. And this led to the fact that Ministry of Finance modified the law. So since um, 2019, this scheme became impossible. And uh, next red flag is about transactions between suppliers and uh, shell companies. When it comes to very large contracts and bribes are involved, uh, there are technical issue. How to cash out a large amount of money? Because bribes are usually given in the form of cash and you cannot uh, just cash out a large amount from supplier's bank account. There are strict limits, anti-money laundering compliance rules and so on. And also large taxes have to be paid on this money. And usually for such cases, Fraudulent suppliers tend to use shell companies to cash out large amount of money. And this allows uh, them to avoid taxes and use cash for bribes. Uh, and those shell companies uh, are fake companies that exist only on paper and registered on nominees. Typically billions of tenge are channeled uh, through a such shell company. And when tax officials and law enforcement agents come with questions, uh, this nominee became uh, criminally responsible. Uh, so that's why nominee are usually victims themselves. Typically they are people from socially vulnerable segments of population. For example, homeless, drug addicts, alcoholics, convicts, disabled people and so on. And to identify such red flag, uh, you need to uh, gather the list of potential shell companies and uh, you need uh, data source of transactions between government suppliers and those uh, shell companies, for example, invoicing that data. And uh, making the list of suspicious companies require using the methods of scoring. And uh, you need a large amount of reliable data about companies, their activities, their founders and executives. Uh, but this is a topic for another big presentation. And we are going to the next slide. It, it's uh, also uh, about transaction between uh, subcontractors and uh, shell companies. Um, quite often, fraudulent suppliers make a long chains of shell companies for cashing out. I have seen chains more than five companies. The longer the chain is, the more difficult it is to prove suppliers' involvement in fraud. Uh, so uh, you need uh, a large amount of invoicing data to uh, detect uh, this kind of red flag. And uh, the last flag is about a connection between executives of a customer and a supplier. Uh, 
uh, this re reflects is about relations uh, between ex executives or decision makers and executives, founders, uh, and decision makers of uh, the suppliers. And there are several types of connections, for example, family relations, uh, wife, uh, son, brother, sister, husband of wife, uh, and, uh, and so on. Uh, colleagues, uh, when they work at the same time in the same organization, uh, business relations uh, like uh, buying or selling uh, vehicles, real estate to each other, uh, maybe common real estates, common property, common companies, and so on. And also shared uh, addresses when a uh, person live in the same place at the same time. And to detect this type of relations, you need a uh, large amount of data, mainly from government databases. Uh, so uh, this is the last uh, red flag uh, in my presentation. And in conclusion, I would like to say that red flags can be successfully applied by the government, and especially by law enforcement, and those projects can can, can give a good economic uh, effect. So I definitely recommend uh, you to work with your local uh, government authorities. Uh, thank you. All right, thank you so much. And thank you so much Vitaly for that um, insightful presentation. And thank you to Camilla for um, introducing us to the conf um, concept of red flags, our indicator guidance as well, and the methodology. I think the one of the biggest takeaways I think from today's session is that you see like that even implementing the red flags methodology is highly dependent on the data being available. So these are the different ways um, we, we need to encourage the government to publish procurement data and also actively engage our civil society or any advocacy groups to encourage the government to publish data so that we can carry out research um, with the red flags methodology. And I want to thank everyone for being quite engaging and adding their questions to our call notes. So I'm going to go to the call notes. I've also pulled some questions from the chat section in there. So I'm going to go to the call notes and start um, running through the questions. And please, if you want to also ask questions directly, you can um, raise your hand and we can do that. But before I even go into our notes, I think I want to give a shout out to Development Gateway. I noticed some of them are on this call and there are some of our, and there are some of the team members are on this call and there's our partners who have developed a red flags and corruption risk dashboard that is very useful. So I'm wondering, is anyone from the Development Gateway team willing to pipe up to just share some insights on their experience in developing their risk dashboard? Anyone from DG willing to do that? I guess not, but um, I thank you for, I thank you. Is someone on Hi, hi guys. Yeah, Mihai here from DG. Yeah, we've, oh, thank you, uh, most of what we've heard here uh, is similar to what we've experienced. We have a separate set of flags, like uh, more, more or less like what you have uh, shown and with rules and uh, certain phases. And uh, anyway, this uh, and it has brought us some insight uh, for our clients into uh, data issues mostly. So in most cases, we found a lot of data issues that, uh, that we, we managed to sort out and, uh, and yeah, uh, maybe other, other things as well. Anyway, this uh, uh, presentation is very interesting for us because, as as you mentioned, we've we've developed a similar uh, resource. So, unfortunately, I don't have a presentation right now. So, <laughs> yeah, well, feel free to share a link to the risk da dashboard in the chat so that people sure. can have a look. Thank you. And um, I can see that Helen Derbyshire has her hand up. So. Um, I'll just ask you to unmute and please ask your question before I go to the call notes. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. And can you hear me fine? You can hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you fine. Yes, great. Thanks, uh, Camila and uh, Vitaly for the very interesting presentations. I probably got a lot of questions, including about 
I mean, you focus on the red flags, but are more about the uh, actual procurement uh, phase. Although you did mention at the beginning that you have these the, the planning stage, and I still think we have a challenge of getting at the the way that procurement contracts are set up and designed, and how we identify whether there's perhaps been, you know, a problem in the design. But <clears throat> my question specifically is for Vitaly. I was listening to everything you said about, I mean, you're a private contractor working for the government. <clears throat> you're not the government. You're not law enforcement. And yet it sounded like you were able to get access to all kinds of databases with personal data, including the database of homeless people, um, databases of people's family connections. And I was just thinking, wow, in a European Union context, to what extent would it be possible, even if you know if a database of homeless people exists? I don't know if it does in all countries, to be honest. But whether it would be even possible to take that data and run it through, uh, you know, for, for a non-law enforcement, non-government department to do that kind of big data analysis with people's personal data. So it's a question to you whether anyone else has ever commented that to you, and maybe it's an open question. Anyone else on the call who has a reflection on that? How do, how do we do this processing of people's names in contexts where it's much harder? Civil society can't get access to these databases of people's names because we wouldn't be able to access them for data protection reasons. So I think there's, a, there's an interesting challenge there. I'll, I'll leave it at that if my question is clear. And thanks again for the interesting presentations. Yeah, thank you very much for your question. And uh, the data in um, in these projects um, are uh, located in uh, the servers on uh, of those customers, and uh, this data is fully secured. And all of our uh, employees sign um, NDAs and other documents, and uh, it's as uh, a first, and we. Uh, cannot copy or cannot transfer the data uh, out of the house of uh, those uh, customers. So uh, it is fully protected uh, at first and some uh, kinds of uh, sensitive data is also protected from us. So we only uh, develop a risk algorithm and we use uh, test the data to uh, prove that it works uh, fine. And then, uh, for example, prosecutors or financial police analysts uh, uh, use uh, our app on a uh, full amount of data uh, because they have rights to access uh, this data. And of course, um, no, mm, uh, there, there are many data sources that uh, one customer uh, can access according to the law and other cast, our customer cannot access uh, because uh, this will be violation uh, of the law. So uh, what can monitor uh, prosecutors cannot uh, be monitored by uh, financial police and uh, so on. Uh, so uh, we have about 10 years of experience in this field and uh, the data uh, protection uh, questions arises uh, all the time in all projects. Uh, so uh, I, it is uh, fully legal and uh, fully, um, fully secure. And just to, to add to that question that I think it's, it's, it's really interesting and it's worth discussing is that, for instance, the, the first guidance, the, the procurement guidance and red flags methodology, it's only focused on procurement data. So most of those red flags that you will find there, you will be able to calculate them with procurement data that should be public. So no confidential information should be there. Uh, it will all, of course, depend on the availability of those fields and data in each context. But also, as Vitaly was showing, you can actually expand your risk uh, analysis and metrics if you use other sources of information. Some of those sources might include personal data, but for instance, there are other cases where um, there's, for instance, a current effort, for instance, on disclosing information about beneficial owners of companies that are actually 
um, uh, signing contracts with the government. So there's an effort of making that data public. And then if that data is public, then you can actually expand uh, and, and calculate a lot of these risk indicators. Um, there are also other flags related to, uh, for instance, um, political connections. So normally people who are in, in public in public charges or in public um, th that are part of the government, those lists are public. So it's a mix of uh, with public data and data that should be public, actually there's a lot that can be done. But of course, in other sensitive cases, this, uh, this uh, considerations and privacy uh, should be considered as well. But I would say that for the bigger, the bigger picture, it's actually quite possible to, to run this, this indicators. Um, so not sure, Andy, if, if we pop into some of the questions uh, in the in the document. I see there there are a lot of of questions. Yeah. There are lots of uh -huh. questions on there. So let me start through them. And I see that you started answering some of them. Thank you. Um, but just for the benefit of the entire room, somebody asked the question about how they can become a Kingfisher user. So for those interested in that, please email data at open-contracting.org. That is our um, OCDS help desk, and they will provide guidance on that process. The second question we have here is um, for Camilla on how corruption may happen in different stages. In the award column, it says that um, a country has no history in providing service or products. Or, um, so why is this, a company has no history in providing a service or products. So why is this considered a red flag? What happens if a new supplier is trying to expand their business and wants to provide that service or product? Yeah, so this is this is a great question, and I think uh, a good example of this is, for instance, what we saw last year uh, during the pandemic. So, as you say, uh, having new suppliers in in a market in a particular market is actually something desirable. You want to be able to include as much suppliers as possible and make uh, procurement um, diverse and, and and generate opportunities for a lot of companies. But then uh, this is considered a red flag, and as I mentioned. The red flag is not necessary that, that this is wrong, but it's if you find this in, in a procedure or in a market, then it's something that's worth investigating. So as you mentioned, if you have a company that, let's say, historic, it, it can be two cases. It can be a company that has never submitted a bid and it's a new bidder in the system. So this can be actually like a new company willing to participate with the government. But we've also seen cases of companies, let's say that, Historically, they have provided, um, I don't know, let's say paper. So there were suppliers of office supplies for the government. And all of a sudden, during the pandemic, we saw that this type of suppliers were actually bidding for contracts related to medical supplies or masks or other procedures. So in some context, and we've seen with evidence that this can actually signal that it's a company that's actually do not have those goods and services that there might be problems with the delivery so it might it, it's worth investigating further so that's why this red flag is included in the list and it can also as i mentioned it's important to keep that context into account for each of these indicators because it can be more or less relevant depending on the context and then i think i can answer the next question as well about um, if we have suggestions on how to handle difference between sectors and calculating a red flag, uh, because it can vary across sectors. And my answer there, and I think we Vitaly show it uh, quite clear in an example that he gave, is that when you do this red flag analysis, it's really important to like not run it for all the procurement data, because if you're looking at particular indicators, you might need to segment, for instance, uh, by regions, or by market. So if you're, as, as you mentioned in the question, if you're doing pollution analysis, the first thing is to segment the markets, the, the particular markets or sectors, and then even regionally, this can happen as well. So when you do this, uh, this analysis, it's important to run it and, and segment it depending, depending on what you're looking for. It can be sectors, it can be a geographical location, it can be an analysis focused on a particular entity, so it's really important to keep uh, that in mind. 
Yeah, thank you, Camilla. I was taking notes so that um, our audience can also refer to the answers in the documents. So the next question is, where can we find the Red Flags Notebook? And you're given a thumbs up that it was a great job and is an obvious next step that we now have a notebook. And that's from Colin Modry, one of our partners in the field that actively builds capacity of other partners. Thank you, Colin. So Camilla? Yeah, no. So I will, we will share all the resources in, in yeah. this in this document. So just feel free after this call and you will circulate the document as well if you register to the webinar. So we'll pop all the links both for the, the presentations and uh, all the resources that we mentioned. And we can guide you on how to use those as well. All right. Um, thank you, Camilla. And then the next question, I think, is in reference to Vitaly's presentation. Um, Valetta asked that, what about ex ante control in public procurement? I'm not sure what is in ex ante control. Could, could you please specify it? As far as I know, ex ante refers to um, results that are made based on estimates or um, estimation. So, um, not actually what the real numbers are, but if Violetta can clarify the context she's referring to, if you're still on the call, Violetta. Let's see. Um, Violetta, would you like to expand on your question? Um, I don't think she's here. Uh, okay, she's Maybe not there. Well, can you hear me? Yes. Hello. Um, yes, we can hear you. Um, so um, this is Isaac from Nigeria. Isaac. Okay. Hello, Isaac. Yeah. So ex ante control is, I think, is referring to uh, procurement audits kind of exercise. You understand? So at uh, which um, responsibility strictly lies uh, with the um, supreme audits sometimes, and uh, probably the regulators procurement regulators that we have in the country. So um, probably she's just asking that um, it's okay. some people's role to, to begin to dig into this data, you understand, and uh, begin to act on them uh, through the ex ante you know, uh, activities for uh, in the sphere of public procurement. So I think probably that's the kind of thing she's trying to refer to. Um, Violetta, I've asked you to unmute so you can go ahead and speak. I think she's able to speak now. So if you can um, go ahead, please do so. And uh, I think it's uh, exempt control. Uh, it's pre before they actually, yeah. Uh, and uh, if it, uh, if uh, we're telling about um, plans or uh, plan stage, yeah, uh, then uh, we can uh, we can calculate some of red flags uh, and to do some preventions. Uh, so before uh, purchase, purchasing actually take place before tender, uh, so uh, we calculate uh, some risks in uh, the plan stage, for example, overestimation of price, and we use uh, price data to calculate median price, and then we compare it to plans. And uh, if we found a plan to contract with a single source uh, supplier without any competition and at our estimated price, we can interfere and to change uh, the way of uh, the way of procedure uh, to a competitive fund so uh, we can prevent uh, the damage for government and uh, like that we calculate some uh, red flags like overestimation uh, like inadequate uh, uh, type of procedure uh, so source procedure and, and so on and yeah uh, sometimes uh, prosecutors and uh, other government authorities uh, use uh, the results of red flags and in uh, planning stage to um, to change the plans and uh, there is a good economic uh, effect on it yeah
Thank you so much, Vitaly. I hope that was um, able to answer your question. And thank you to everyone in the chat section that tried to um, explain what ex ante controls are. Um, that helped in Vitaly answering the question. So thank you all. Then the next question we have is from Tol Caulfield. Um, I see part of it has been answered, but for the sake of the room, the question was, will the 2016 report be updated or is the project only updating the red flags themselves? Also, is the concept that the, these 73 updated red flags are to replace the prior ones or are the 73 an addition to the prior red flags? Camilla? Yeah, no, just answering the document, as I mentioned. So uh, yeah, the, as we updated this list of red flags that included and revisited, we had a previous list of red flags for those of, uh, of you who hadn't seen our previous guidance. So when we did this update, we uh, looked at those red flags, identify which could be duplicated or uh, condensed in a single indicator, et cetera. And we will be in, in this year updating all the materials that we have related to red flags. So, uh, we'll be posting those in a in a mailing list and in, in a web page and our, our Twitter as well. So we'll happy to share those. Thank you. And now to our next question: um, Is blockchain technology used to improve transparency in public procurements? Is that something that we've seen? Um, either of you, Camilla, or anyone in the room who might have some insights on that, please feel free to raise your hand to answer. Thank you. Does anyone have any insights on blockchain technology for red flag? For red Unfortunately, flag? I don't have, but happy to hear if anyone in, in the call um, has any insights on this. Um, I think I can ask one. Uh, okay. We have discussed uh, blockchain uh, for public procurement in Kazakhstan with um, our uh, Ministry of Finance, and uh, the answer was no. <laughs> um, it, it, it is very difficult to, uh, uh, to integrate blockchain technology in public procurement because uh, procurement uh, procedures changes uh, every year and uh, also uh, pr uh, software uh, develops uh, very quickly and uh, blockchain is uh, very complicated uh, technology and uh, the immutable uh, immutable property of uh, blockchain uh, is uh, is good idea but when you have uh, open data uh, and uh, all data are uh, published through uh, application programming interface or maybe uh, in some uh, uh, some other formats uh, then you uh, do not need to uh, such uh, complicated technology like uh, blockchain because uh, everything you publish you cannot unpublish uh, again so uh, you cannot uh, change uh, the data now, afterwards because uh, someone already copied it. So uh, blockchain uh, uh, doesn't add any additional value for public procurement except uh, the um, pricing or accepted stage of, uh, of tender when uh, you compare uh, two bids from different suppliers and uh, we must trust uh, government, we must trust uh, software that compares it, and uh, uh, if uh, there is some leaks, uh, for example, system administrator or someone can access uh, before the tender ended, uh, access to pricing data and to uh, share this pricing data with uh, some supplier, some uh, competitor, uh, and to have a bribe for it, for example, this, uh, this is the case for using uh, blockchain. Uh, so the pricing data bits actually uh, can be uh, stored on the computer of suppliers until the uh, date and uh, you know, time uh, of, uh, of tender end. And uh, after ending uh, these uh, these offers, uh, 
go to uh, go uh, to portal and uh, compares to uh, with blockchain records uh, for uh, hashes uh, and uh, we have to prove that uh, they are not changed afterwards and then we can compare it and use uh, to detect uh, to identify winner uh, so this is only one case for blockchain for public procurement uh that i see and uh the uh, other cases is uh, over complicated and uh, actually doesn't add any value to uh, the public procurement uh, this is my opinion all right thank you thank you so much um Vitaly, for that um insight and it's good for us to learn um about blockchain and how useful or not so useful it could be in procurement and the next question is for you again Vitaly in relation to your presentation on the shell company so it's a, the question is from Sophie Brown and she's asking how did you know the supplier was sending 20 percent to the shell company um, because uh, we have uh, uh, contracts data and uh, we uh, have payments data and we see for example 100 millions in gear uh, was transferred between, between customer to supplier and uh, we also have invoicing data uh, and uh, we see uh, that uh, right afterwards uh, supplier transfer 20 millions uh, which exactly 20 percent for for example this is just for example uh, to a shell company so uh, it's it's clear when you have uh, much uh, data, but uh, invoicing data is uh, closed, and only uh, only general prosecutor's office can access uh, to it, and only financial police was able to access to this kind of uh, data to uh, to do uh, calculations uh, and monitor this red flag. All right, thank you. Um, thank you for answering that question. The next question is from Tina Tinninua. The question says, how does the state procurement agency in Kazakhstan act on the revealed violations? Are cases forwarded to the law enforcement agencies? And what are the mechanisms for holding those public officials accountable? Um, this is a hard question, how to do. Um, um, how to make uh, them accountable and uh, if uh, uh, our uh, app detects some uh, risks uh, it uh, analysts uh, always document uh, these detections and they must uh, do a formal uh, decision to uh, to use uh, the results uh, in uh, in uh fuser investigations or to uh, mark them as false positive and uh, move to the next one so everything is documented uh, at the first and then uh, if they uh, uh, move next to the uh, investigation uh, there are some uh, procedures uh, with this you uh must uh, do it officially so they uh, initiated uh and they write some papers and uh to do uh to do official um <laughs> work uh with this risk so um everything is uh on paper everything uh makes them accountable for future actions all right, thank you. And um, for everyone's reference to the um, blockchain question as well, um, someone in the group, um, Alexander, has dropped some links, some useful links for anyone that learns, wants to learn more in terms of the research around blockchain and public procurement. So please look in the chat section for that. And it, we've also added it to the call notes. Um, and so the next question, which is an open question, is if gender um, discrimination in contract allocation can be considered a red flag? Kamala, I feel like this is something you'll be happy to answer. Yeah, sure. So thank you for much. Uh, thank you so much for the question. Um, so I guess 
if we look at the guidance, and, and just to clarify, so that list of 73 red flags is not the only 73 red flags that you can calculate. So of course, this is something that you can adapt to your context. You can add other indicators, complement them with other sources of data as well. And in terms of gender, um, then I, I guess my answer would be that, for instance, if you have, if you're interested in analyzing procurement with a gender lens, then a lot of these indicators can be adapted. So for instance, if you want to see like competition, uh, indi like competition related red flags, and then analyze them through a gender lens. If you have that segmentation and data available, you can do so. Uh, in terms of a red flag, for instance, if there's a, a regulation that states that a proportion of the total value of the total number of contracts should be awarded, let's say, to women-owned businesses, you can actually check that with the, with the data if you have gender disaggregated data and see if that complies or, or not, and that can pop a red flag in that case. So I would say that um, in short, if you have, besides like all the procurement information, if you have an extra field that indicates if a company is women-owned or um, if most of the, of, the, of the stakeholders are women or in directive positions, if you have that field that you can disaggregate this analysis and do it with a gender lens. So I think it's great also to start thinking about how can we adapt uh, these indicators and others to look them uh, with the gender lens, or if we talk about other topics as well on sustainability, um, that we can combine and combine uh, those two when when we're doing this uh, risk analysis. And then there's uh, I can go to the next question about data uh, on suppliers and 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 shell companies. So. If we need to advocate for enabling legislation of beneficial ownership disclosure, and why is this not of the red flags identified at the planning and tender stage? I guess, of course, um, uh, this is, uh, as, as I mentioned, so the list, it's not there because this is only considering like procurement information. So beneficial ownership is, it's really hard to find currently, and we are advocating and more countries are signing commitments on to publish this information. So of course, uh, this could be added um, as part of, of the indicators that can be calculated and expand a, a lot of these indicators. And of course, there are a lot of efforts on advocating for this information to be public. Uh, there's uh, a lot of work currently being done, as I mentioned, commitments from different countries and international organizations working on this. Uh, so hopefully in the coming years, we will see more publishers of beneficial ownership information, and then we can expand um, uh, that uh, indicators, those indicators. Thanks, Camilla. I think the rest of the questions are for you. It seems like you're in high demand now. Um, so there was a question on which indicators actually refer to the um, planning stage and the person didn't quite hear the answer. And then you can also just answer the second question, which is a simpler one of who does the red flagging. Um, so in terms of the planning stage, I think Vitaly and you're happy, uh, happy to, to add uh, as well. I think he mentioned some of the red flags that you can calculate at the planning stage um, and a guidance. So for instance, we have red flags related to not publishing key planning information, for instance, market studies or feasibility studies. So if that information is not available and you're not able to check that information, uh, that is something that you can look for. Uh, another one, um, and if I have it on the top of my head, um, is related to, for instance, manipulating procurement thresholds. So uh, if, you, if you have the estimated value of the procurement in, from the planning stage, you can actually detect if this is something that uh, you, you, you might be manipulating the threshold to avoid competitive procedures. So it's just a couple of examples um, that you can see from the planning stage. And you can see uh, in a guidance as well, um, some other examples. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, the, the other question about who does the red flag, uh, as I mentioned, this approach can be used by different different agencies. So who does and who decides if this is an indicator and a red flag or not? I guess there's evidence, there's uh, international good practice, there are regulations as well, but it's, it varies on the context. But my message there is that 
anyone can use this approach, whether it is our government agencies, the private sector, auditors, um, journalists, academia, civil society in general. So it's a guidance that can be adapted. I, what, what I want you to take up from here is that there is, if you have procurement data, if you have other sources of public data as well, you can actually detect potential corruption before it happens. So you can either use this list as, as, as a guidance, you can use other sources, there are other materials as well that you can combine. But just so you know that this is possible, that is something that government civil society are using in practice. Um, so it, it, it's a good approach, uh, both to monitor and to potentially detect corruption as well. And then there's another one about how does this relate to OECD's corruption risks? So, um, of course, yeah, the, I know the OECD, we have in the guidance, you will see that we have other sources. So, as I mentioned, there are a lot of red flag resources out there or uh, guidebooks, toolboxes about specifically, for instance, about collusion or a particular set of indicators. So, this is something that can complement the guidance as well. And we added references uh, in, the, in the document as well, if you wanna take a look at those documents. But the idea is that this approach, th th these approaches can be complemented as well. All right, thank you, Camilla. Um, and that brings us to the end of the questions in our call notes. I don't know if anyone in the room wants to ask any further questions as we wrap up um, the session, but let me just share my screen one last time. And please just uh, raise up your hands if you have any other question as we bring today's session to an end. And I try to share my screen, give me a moment, please. What is going on? So can you all see my screen uh, now? <laughs> yes, we can we can see your screen. Uh, let me see if I can mute that person. So um basically um I just want to work through some of the OCP resources that are available to you. And my screen is acting up, so just give me a moment. Yes. And I just want to go back on the slides. So um, of course, as many of you know, we have our OCDS help desk where you can get support. We mentioned that you can reach them at data at open-contracting.org. All of these resources will definitely be shared with you at the end of today's session. And something else we want to share with you today is, um, is our learning resources. We have a page that we um, created earlier this year for users and publishers of open contracting data called the OCP Learn page. And that page just provides a guided um, journey for if you're either a user or a publisher through um, implementing open contracting and OCDS. And we have our red flags methodology that um, Camilla walked through and the red flags indicator spreadsheet all of these resources will be shared with you at the end of um, today's session. And we also have learning videos. So our learn page contains the learning videos we recently developed. Um, they're currently in English, but by next week, we would have the Spanish and Russian version of the videos available for you to access as well. And for to shed some light on the resources that we've now made available, we have something at the end of summer, we've created a program called the OCP Summer of Learning. So if you search the hashtag OCDS101 on Twitter, or um, if you go to our LinkedIn page, you will find the details as we take you through a six week journey of learning about open contracting and implementing the open contracting data standard. So I really want to take time to thank you all for patiently working through this session with us. And finally, we want to hear back from you and I'm inviting you to please kindly complete our post event survey. Uh, we want to capture all the feedback um, from today's session and how we can improve on our subsequent webinars as we'll be running our webinars on a more frequent basis based, based on your asks within our survey. So please, I'll give you about two minutes 
to complete that survey as we wrap up today's session. And just to remind you that thanks to everyone who shared their information and questions on the document, uh, just to remind you that we will add the, both the presentations and the different resources we presented here in there so that you can have them and, and you will circulate an email after this. Uh, but we're happy to keep in touch. If any of you has any specific questions, are interested in running this using OCDS data, please feel, please feel free to reach out to us. And we're more than happy to help and see users globally trying to use these approaches. We always like to showcase uh, examples of people working in this field. So uh, please feel free to reach out uh, to us. All right, so thank you everyone. Um, and that brings us to the end of today's webinar. And I'm looking forward to continuing this conversation on our various platforms with you. So take care and enjoy the rest of your day. I would also send out the um, survey in our follow-up email with all of our resources. So thank you all and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, bye. All right, bye everyone. Thank you.